Hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to be going through the start to finish setup instructions for the IR controller project, uh, including assembly and how to get it set up to work with Amazon's Alexa service. Uh, so let's jump right in. Uh, right here, uh, we have a schematic of the entire assembly of the device, including the receiver and one infrared transmitter using the 2N2222 uh, transistor, as well as two resistors. Um, this is designed to be used with the Node MCU version of the ESP8266, um, but would be compatible with others. You just need to have a different schematic. For a more practical approach, this is what an assembled version looks like on a breadboard. Um, here you have your receiver, which is configured to align with the three bolt ground and D5 pins on the Node MCU, so you don't need any wires. It just plugs right in adjacent to those three pins. <coughs> um, on the bottom, the picture here you have your positive and negative connections to the VIN and the ground. By connecting directly to the VIN this provides a 5 volt source directly off of the USB power controller um, and you can draw a lot more current off of it as opposed to drawing current directly off one of the data pins. Over here you have the transistor. Um, this is a 3 pin transistor. The middle pin is the data pin so that's what tells the transistor went to open and close the circuit and that's connected ultimately via a resistor over to D2 here. Then you have the LED here. This LED can handle one amp of current in short bursts. You have a 10 ohm resistor here to limit the current getting pulled off the VIN um, and that ends up pulling about 500 milliamps in this configuration. And then down here you have, you don't necessarily need this component, this is just a button. Um, and it's connected to the GPI 010 or uh, SD3 pin and is, it's connected to ground over here so it, while this button is pressed if you boot up the device it will force configuration mode where you can reset the Wi-Fi settings so if you have a new router or want to change settings around you just hold this button down during uh, boot you can also just connect with a regular wire from SD3 to the ground rail and it'll have the same functionality all right. Once you've finished assembling your device, you're going to be ready to configure your development environment. To do that, you're going to need to install a couple pieces of software. You're going to need the Arduino IDE. You're going to need the ESP8266 core for the Arduino IDE. Um, both of these pieces of software are linked on the README of the GitHub, so you can go there to install them. They're pretty straightforward to install. I'm not going to go over the specific steps for that. Uh, once you have those installed, you're going to download the blueprint, which is the .ino file listed on the GitHub page, which looks just like this. And this is what it looks like when it's opened in the Arduino, at least the 1.8 software. This particular blueprint has multiple dependencies that you'll need to install. To do that, you go to the sketch menu, you go to include library and manage libraries, and from here, you should be able to find all the libraries you need. Um, they're all listed on the README of the GitHub page, but to go over them quickly, you need the ESP8266 web server, which is here. You'll need the ESP8266 Wi-Fi package, which is here. You'll need the Arduino JSON package. You will need the Wi-Fi manager package. You will need the NTP client package. And finally, you'll need the IR Remote ESP8266 package. Um, to install any of these packages, you would just search for it like I did and then click on Install. Um, as of creating this video, the Blueprint is compatible with all the latest versions of all of these packages, so you can just go ahead and install the latest ones. Once that's installed, you should be ready to try and compile the Blueprint and make sure that you don't have any errors. There's really not much that you'll need to reconfigure on the Blueprint. Everything should be good to go as is. Um, any settings that are dynamic, you'll have the option to change from the Wi-Fi manager page. So you click the checkbox to verify the code and compile. That'll take probably about a minute. Once you're done compiling, you want to upload the blueprint to the new device you just put together. So you plug that in via USB and you click upload. That'll probably take another minute or two. Once you're done uploading, you'll see this 100% mark at the bottom. You can also open up your serial monitor to get some more information about the device. You want this set to 115200 baud. 
Um, you'll need to reset the device to watch the boot process if you open this after the upload. If you opened it beforehand, then you'll see it go through the whole process. I'm going to reset now. I'm resetting just by pressing the reset button on the Node MCU. And you can see the boot process here and that the IR Blaster has entered configuration mode. In configuration mode, the device acts as a Wi-Fi access point and has a default IP address of 192.168.4.1. You should be able to go up to your Wi-Fi settings and click on IR Blaster configuration. Give that a second to connect. You'll see on the serial output that it detected a new connection. If you're on a Mac, this will pop up with a configuration thing by default. Otherwise, you need to go to your web browser and go to 192.168.4.1 in your address bar to bring up this same page. From here, you click Configure Wi-Fi. You click on whichever Wi-Fi network you want to connect to. You enter the password for that Wi-Fi network. You're going to name your IR Blaster. You're going to set up a passcode so that people can't send commands without the passcode. And then you're going to set a default port that the web server is going to be available on. And then you're going to save, and then the device will reboot. You can watch that on the serial output here as it goes through its rebooting process. And it'll show you your local IP address, the URL if your router supports MDNS, which port your HTTP server is running on, as well as your external IP address, which will be important later. Now that your device is up and running, you want to open up your web browser and navigate to the host name of the device, .local colon port, in this format here. If your router does not support MDNS, you can just navigate to the local IP address. This again is all listed in the serial output when you first boot the device. This will take you to a page that looks just like this. Um, it'll have all the IP address information at the top as well as the MAC address of your ESP8266. It will have an area that shows codes that were recently transmitted as well as codes that were recently received. So far no codes have been sent or received, but we're going to change that shortly. At the bottom of the page it has all the various pinouts for the receivers and the transmitters. So if you were to choose to add additional transmitters or make sure that your receiver is connected to the appropriate device, um, you can just sort of debug with this information down here. So our next step is going to be to capture some commands from whatever remote we're trying to emulate. I have my TV remote in my hand now. I'm going to point it at the receiver on the device and press the power button. When a code is received, the ESP8266 should have a little LED that lights up for a second, indicating that it had successfully received a code. At this point, you can go back to your browser and refresh the page. And here I can see under the codes received the command um, and the formatting of the command. If I click on the timestamp over here, it'll take me to a detail page that shows more information about the code that was just received, as well as the URLs that are going to be needed later on to communicate and send these codes back out. Now that you have this information, there's an intermediate step that I'm not going to demonstrate on video, but is critical to make this function. You're going to need to go into your router settings and enable port forwarding. In this case, we use 667 as the port. You're going to need to forward that port to the local IP address of your ESP8266 IR controller. Because of the way the Echo executes commands, everything is sent from an external source. So unless that port's open, the Echo skill will not be able to communicate with the device. Now that we've captured the code, we're going to configure the device to work with the Amazon Echo. You're going to navigate over to your Alexa setup page. You're going to find a skill named IR controller. In this, you're going to log in and authenticate with your Amazon account. Once you've done that, you're finished with the configuration portion of the skill from the Alexa page, um, and you have to start registering your smart devices. So to do that, you're going to navigate to this URL here, which is listed in the readme, tehpsyc.pythonanywhere.com. You're going to log in with your Amazon account. I already have quite a few devices set up. Um, when you first open this page, since you'll have no devices, you'll be defaulted to the Add New Device page, which will look something like this. So what you're going to do is scroll down and go through all the options that you want. Uh, the top three need to be set. 
the friendly name is going to be whatever you call this device. So we're going to call this living room TV. The endpoint ID just has to be some unique identifier. It can be pretty much anything. Uh, no spaces are allowed though, so just use hyphens. And then the description can almost always be the same as the title. <clears throat> so if you go down to power controller, we can enable the ability to turn the TV on and off. So you check enabled. We're going to go back to our IR controller. And scroll down to our external IP address command. We're going to copy this URL here. And we're going to paste it. Um, because TVs toggle on and off with the same code, we can use the same URL for power off. We're going to add our passcode. Without the passcode, the device will not send the commands. Once you've done that, I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom. You can add in additional options such as playback controller to add things like play, pause, stop. You can do volume control. You can do input control to change the device input to Blu-ray or HDMI. Um, and then you can also make a scene controller for custom things that aren't supported by the above commands. You're going to hit create device. Hopefully you'll get a nice success message. And then you should see the device that you just created. Now that you've created your device, you can go back to your Amazon Alexa page. You can go to your smart home settings, devices, and discover devices. And you can see that the new living room TV that we just created has shown up. All right, now we're going to a live video. Um, I've mounted my IR controller on the opposite side of the room facing the TV. It's about 15 feet away right now. My echo is down here. We're going to give this a shot. Alexa, turn on living room TV. Okay. There you go. LED just came on. Give it a second to catch up. There it goes. Okay, Alexa, turn off living room TV. to demonstrate some of the other features that I have. I have volume control enabled for my soundbar. I can say Alexa surround sound volume up five. Okay. And you'll see it'll progressively increase the volume. I can also mute Alexa mute surround sound. Okay. And there you have it. Hopefully that wasn't too hard to follow. The setup process has gotten a lot easier as the project has evolved. I think, as far as I know, this is the first uh, sort of DIY homebrew Alexa project that supports um, native voice commands like this that doesn't require you to register an Amazon developer account or go through all the hoops to sort of fake your own skill. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy.